Dr. Robert Kushner. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome you to the epidemic within the pandemic, managing complications in populations with obesity. This activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Novo Nordisk. CME Outfitters LLC is an award-winning accredited provider worldwide and is the accredited provider for its continuing education activities. Today's activity is also eligible for ABIM MOC credit and as a CME for MIPS improvement activity. You can see instructions on your screen for details on receiving these types of credit. You can also follow at CME Outfitters on Twitter to be part of today's live Twitter and to learn more about upcoming CME CE opportunities and healthcare news. As mentioned, I'm Dr. Bob Kushner, Professor of Medicine and Medical Education at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. And I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Ken Fujioka from the Nutrition and Metabolic Research Center at Scripps Center in San Diego. Welcome, Ken. Also joining us today is Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford, who is an obesity medicine physician scientist at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Fatima. Thanks for having me. To begin our program today, I'd like to review the three learning objectives. After participating in this activity, you should be able to better do, one, identify pathophysiologic features of obesity that influence weight loss and maintenance, summarize guidelines for screening, diagnosis, and patient counseling for obesity and obesity-related disorders, and third, assess efficacy and safety of available and emerging therapies for long-term treatment of obesity. I'd first like to start asking Fatima to set the stage for us today by briefly talking about the collision of the obesity and COVID-19 pandemics. This really has created a perfect storm for poor outcomes in certain racial and ethnic groups. It also revealed the disparities in care for obesity that were perhaps less apparent before COVID-19. Fatima, go ahead and tell us about this, please. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dr. Kushner, for setting me up to really introduce this issue of COVID-19 as a pandemic and its collision with obesity and its disproportionate impact on communities of color. Um, what we do know is that the global prevalence of obesity has risen dramatically. From 1975 until now, we've seen um, a tripling of that. And by 2025, which is only four years from now, it's expected that 2.7 billion adults will have overweight and 1 billion and greater will have the disease of obesity. This is particularly concerning because when we look at obesity as a disease and as a risk factor for adverse outcomes with COVID-19, we do know that obesity triples the risk of hospitalization and significantly increases the risk for mechanical ventilation and unfortunately, death. So I wanna bring this up. As a black woman physician scientist, I really have been paying attention to the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 and obesity on communities of color here in the United States and around the world. And what we can see here is that black indigenous and Latinx individuals are much more likely to have this disease of obesity. As you can see here on the slide, as we're looking at the colors on the right side, um, the prevalence of obesity is, is high, but when we overlay that with the prevalence of COVID-19 and the death from COVID-19, which is disproportionately impacted communities of color, we can see that this is indeed problematic. I do also want to point out that four out of five Latinx um, and American Indian or Alaska Native American women including those that are Black individuals like myself, actually have the diseases of overweight and obesity. So this is of significant and paramount importance. And what we do know is that racial and ethnic disparities in U.S. medical care as a whole and, con and, con and conditions with obesity and COVID being paramount are pervasive. 
Um, studies do suggest that provider interactions with patients of color are less patient-centered with fewer requests for patient input and treatment decisions in general. Efforts should definitely be made to improve the equitable medication uptake and utilization among racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. This is extremely important and clinicians need to keep at the forefront of mind the social determinants of health. But now I wanna hand this back over um, actually in a second. Um, what we do know is these are just a few patient voices. Um, and I wanna hear you to hear Maria. I'm relieved to be fully vaccinated now from COVID but I'm about to give up on losing weight. It is impossible for me to keep it off, she says. Or let's look at what Jeff says. I've worked hard on several occasions to get my weight under control and I've been successful. The problem is I just can't sustain it. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Kushner to lead us into why is it so difficult to sustain weight loss? Dr. Kushner? Yeah. Thanks, Fatima, for the kind of quick update on the, the issues of COVID-19 and obesity and the racial disparities that we have all been, been made so aware of uh, over this past year. You know, your, the questions you raised lead us uh, right into the first objective, which is to identify pathophysiologic features of obesity that influence weight loss and maintenance. Now, on this slide, um, I, I, I often think about the pathology or pathophysiology of obesity by two different uh, issues that we need to be aware of as clinicians. Towards the left is uh, energy balance dysregulation. And why is it that someone who struggles with their weight gains weight? And the second on the right, which is the organ system impairment is what is it about obesity that is so pathologic to all the organ systems that uh, we have and that we treat uh, as clinicians? So regarding the first one, the energy balance equation, what we find uh, is that individuals uh, are in a dysregulation, that is energy intake exceeds energy output. And there's actually a lot of reasons for that. Um, one is on, on, the, on the very next slide, uh, is that, is that they are, there's input from different signals that come from organ systems. Certainly we could have a genetic predisposition to gain weight. Sometimes medications that people take uh, can cause one to, get, uh, to take in more food. And there's also often changes within the brain itself. And as hedonic input may be heightened, actually an individual who is predisposed to gaining weight. We also have different changes in lifestyle, inactivity, a change in our diet, an unhealthy diet, the environment, the community we live in. So all of these factors tend to be dysregulated in someone who's predisposed to uh, gaining weight. You know, before we continue though, let's get our audience involved you can vote now. And here's the first question. Which of the following is true about calorically reduced state after weight loss? Is it A, amylin increases, B, ghrelin decreases, C, GLP-1 decreases, D, sympathetic nervous system tone increases, or E, you're really not sure. Go ahead and vote, please. Now, these are the hormones and the pathophysiologic features that we're going to be talking about that are dysregulated, particularly when one loses weight. So let's see how well uh, all, all of you do when we come up with the answers. Well, the answer is three. Glucagon-like peptide is the one that actually decreases. Uh, and let's get a better look at that uh, in just a moment. Now, to learn more about the many hormones, neuropeptides, and processes involved in weight loss and regain, I want to share with you a very nice animation. And this animation will be available to you, our audience, for your use and for your teaching when you're teaching peers and even patients. Let's take a look at the animation below. When individuals lose weight through caloric restriction and increased physical activity, they activate processes to regain the lost weight and adipose tissue mass. Insulin, shown in yellow, is an anorexigenic mediator. It is secreted by the pancreas and inhibits hypothalamic neuropeptide Y, or NPY, and agouti-related protein, or AGRP, neurons, 
while stimulating POMC and CART neurons. This leads to satiety and decreases feeding while promoting energy expenditure. Amylin, shown in orange, is co-secreted with insulin from the pancreas in response to food ingestion. It delays gastric emptying, inhibits glucagon release to suppress hepatic glucose production, and inhibits food intake. During the calorically reduced state after weight loss, there is a decrease in insulin and amylin, leading to increased NPY and HERP. Importantly, the second set of neurotransmitters, POMC and CART, decrease, creating a so-called yin-yang effect, a duality in the hypothalamus where NPY and AGRP, which increase appetite, are elevated, while POMC and CART, which make a person feel full and decrease appetite, are suppressed. Another anorexigenic mediator, leptin, shown here in red, is synthesized by adipose tissue, leading to reduced food consumption and increased energy output. During the calorically reduced state after weight loss, the amount of leptin moving from fat to the brain is reduced as leptin secretion is diminished. Glucose, shown here in pink, is the only source of energy for neurons. It decreases hunger and food seeking. Dynamic decline in glucose utilization induces hunger and feeding behavior and promotes weight gain. Conversely, increased glucose utilization results in decreased hunger and cessation of feeding. Thyroid hormone T3 stimulates metabolic activity in most body tissues. In the calorically reduced state after weight loss, T3 is diminished, leading to a reduction in calories burned. During steady state, there is normal sympathetic nervous system, or SNS tone. Sympathetic tone is the condition of a muscle when the tone is maintained predominantly by impulses from the sympathetic nervous system. In the calorically reduced state after weight loss, sympathetic tone is diminished so a person burns less calories. This is yet another stimulus to regain weight. Ghrelin is an orexigenic signaling molecule secreted by the stomach. It is increased before meals and decreased after eating. Glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1, and peptide YY, or PYY, are other anorexigenic mediators of energy balance and are part of the gut-brain axis in the homeostasis of body weight. GLP-1 slows the rate of gastric emptying and regulates food intake and appetite. In the calorically reduced state after weight loss, ghrelin increases and GLP-1 and PYY are reduced. Thus, between ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone from the stomach, and the satiety hormones GLP-1 and PYY from the small intestine, they conspire in opposite directions, making one hungrier and feeling less full. During maintenance of a body weight reduction, there is increased skeletal muscle efficiency, thus requiring fewer calories per unit of work than before the weight loss the increased energy efficiency will promote weight regain and recovery of fat mass. As you've just seen, there is evidence that the body's energy balance, weight, and adiposity are intricately controlled by processes resistant to voluntary manipulation. Weight loss interventions evoke powerful and persistent adaptive biological and physiological responses to regain lost weight. I hope you liked that animation. That was kind of cool to, to see how the body works. I, I do want to highlight though a few details in this static slide. Uh, and it's really just to highlight the, the complexity and the interrelationship between signals that come from the gut, come from fat tissue and integrate into different brain systems. The homeostatic pathway, which is in the hypothalamus and the reward pathway, uh, which is outside of that. And, there's a crosstalk, but mostly signals coming to the brain that either increase or decrease our appetite and change energy expenditure, increase or decrease. So it really is integrated within our physiology. I wanna highlight here what happens with weight loss, which clinically is actually one of the most frustrating things we hear from our patients. This is a study, kind of a landmark study that came from New England uh, Journal uh, uh, almost 10 years ago now, where individuals were put on a low calorie diet over 10 weeks and lost 30 pounds. 
And they were then followed out, out to a year. And what you see is a slow, gradual weight gain, which we often see in our patients, as I said, leads often to frustration uh, regarding our body weight. But one of the key things that was identified in a study is what happens to those hormones that we just talked about. And it turns out that leptin, which comes from fat tissues, remains depressed, in this case, 65% reduction, as well as PYY, cholecystokine, and insulin amylin. These are all uh, gut hormones that remain depressed even with the weight uh, regain. And what it goes up is ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone. And, and, and then if you then connect that to appetite, uh, what you see is that on the left, you see that weight regain graph that I just talked about. But now if you actually, uh, um, if you look at appetite uh, and you look at what, you, what goes on with hunger as well as desire to eat, and the way this was done is individuals were given a meal and those hormones uh, uh, are, are being tracked as well as appetite is tracked over four hours after the meal, and it's done at the beginning, week 10 and week 62. And the key point is that it's the same individual, but now they are weight reduced and the whole sense of hunger gets higher and higher, even if they've lost weight because the gut hormones are causing them to be more hungry and the desire to eat goes up. So they, they're driven to eat more and more as time goes on. Now, although I'm not showing you the direct data, there's been incredibly exquisite data presented from the biggest loser, a television show that all of you are familiar with, in which a group of these individuals were followed up out to six years. And what they found is that even after six years, when they regained their weight, their metabolic, uh, uh, their metabolic processes remained adapted. In other words, they were burning less calories, they were more hungry, and there was changes that go on that really did not reverse. So what we see in our patients over one year, they tend to continue over a longer period of time. Now, I'd like to now turn to the second aspect of the physiologic or pathophysiologic basis of obesity, and that is what is it about obesity that causes impairment in multiple organs? Now, there's many processes that occur. The one on top is release of adipokines, which, which you call lipotoxicity. I'm going to talk about a little bit more in the next two slides. But the other processes that also cause impairment is increased mechanical burden, and that's the arthritis of the weight-bearing joints and feeling fatigued, increased abdominal pressure, which pushes our diaphragms up, which help individuals feel more short of breath and push uh, down into the pelvic area, which may cause increased urinary incontinence, particularly in women, uh, increased respiratory burden with sleep apnea, again, shortness of breath, reduced compliance of the chest wall and the lung, fluid hemodynamic changes with hypertension and congestive heart failure leading to increased atrial fibrillation uh, and venous stasis. And we always have to remember that that following an unhealthy diet and being physically inactive in itself can cause impairment in our health. So multiple processes that go on and cause problems with individuals with obesity. But I do wanna focus a little bit more on the adipose tissue. We used to think, depending on how long ago you went to medical school or nursing school or, or uh, other, other areas of training, that fat was just a static organ that stored off uh, energy only. We now know, which I call the modern view, that fat and fat tissue is actually an endocrine organ by releasing what we call adipokines, which are signals released by fat cells or, or cytokines that circulate in an endocrine fashion to the other parts of the body actually cause impairment. And the whole term of lipotoxicity, which is products from fat tissue, which is in the next slide, uh, is what you see these things such as tumor necrosis factor, uh, resistant, uh, reduced adiponectin, uh, angiotensin, and, angiotensin and so forth, circulate throughout the body from the particularly adipo, the adipose tissue in the visceral compartment that really cause havoc in the rest of the body, causing inflammation, increasing asthma, increasing certain amounts of cancer hypertension, uh, type two diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and increased uh, blood clots, which is thrombosis. So for all of these reasons, the current thinking is obesity is a disease, a chronic relapsing condition caused by energy dysregulation, as well as uh, causing impairment in multiple organ systems. Now, what you're seeing now are highlights from a second interactive animation piece available to you 
uh, that you are, have available uh, to download and look at yourself. And another way of looking at what the other issues are all about. And I'm going to try to move on to the next piece. Uh, if I can get back to where I was, thank, thank you very much. Now I wanna now shift our discussion to patient-centered screening, uh, diagnosis and counseling, and what you could do in clinical practice to improve care. This will address our second learning objective, which is to summarize guidelines for screening, diagnosis, and patient counseling for obesity and obesity-related disorders. Fatima, I'm gonna hand it over to you for this section. Thanks so much, Bob. It's a delight to be here to discuss um, our second objective. Um, and I really want us to start by looking at how we define obesity, which is by using BMI criteria. And what you can see on this particular slide is how we look at BMI criteria in the current guidelines that we utilize. So a person is considered to have underweight if their BMI is below 18 and a half. A person is considered to have normal weight status if their BMI is between 18 and a half and 24.9. A person has pre-obesity or overweight when their BMI is between 25 and 29.9. And then we get into our three classes of obesity, class one, class two, and class three, what we consider to be mild, moderate, and severe obesity, mild being characterized by BMI of 30 to 34.9 moderate a BMI of 35 to 39.9, and then those that have severe obesity, a BMI of greater than or equal to 40. But what I do want to pay attention to is how the BMI chart has not been reflective of racial and ethnic minority populations. What we do know is that the BMI chart that we currently use is based upon the Metropolitan Life Insurance Tables from the 1930s. In those calculations, persons that look like myself, racial and ethnic minorities, were not included in those actuarial tables, which are the basis for what we utilize for BMI. As such, I went back to redraw the tables in 2019 and published this study in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, where we use the current NHANES, and the NHANES, of course, is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data to discern what the BMI cutoff should be based upon obesity-related diseases, particularly hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and then greater than two of those risk factors. What I want you to pay attention to on the left side of the slide is that if we're looking at men almost universally, regardless of racial ethnic group here in the United States, the BMI curve actually shifts below 30, with an exception for white men um, with diabetes. You can see the cutoff would be 30, but notice how it shifts below that cutoff for 30 when looking at this in real time. Um, I want to also pay attention to the right side of the screen, and I want to particularly hone in on focusing on Black women, because what we see here is that the BMI curve actually shifts up when we're looking at Black women with hypertension, diabetes, or greater than two risk factors. So we need to be thoughtful and mindful about how BMI does give us heightened weight and calculates a number, but does not give us the end-all be-all for how we should approach thinking about patients with overweight and obesity. What we do know about obesity is that it is a multifactorial disorder where genetics, environment, development, and behavior all play a role in a person's likelihood of having this disease. But what I really want to show you is this next slide. And in this next slide, I love this. And for um, the three of us that are presenting today, we're all very active in a group called the Obesity Society. And this comes out of the Obesity Society in 2015 and really shows you all of the potential um, factors that may play a role in someone having the disease of obesity. What I want you to pay attention to is on the left side in that gray color, we see those factors that are inside of an individual that might lead to obesity. On the right side, things that are outside of the individual that might lead to obesity. In that top thing, you see things that increase your intake. In the bottom, those things that decrease how much you're able to burn. And in the middle, we see things that affect either intake or expenditure or very, very small print. It says unknown. We recognize that there are things that we don't yet know about this disease and we're continuing to learn every day. Now I want to take out a few of these factors. I want to go to the next slide and look at all of those contributors or influencers to obesity. These are the big categories by which um, we can begin to group things. 
So biological or medical reasons why someone may struggle with weight, food and beverage, behavior and environment, maternal and developmental, social, psychological, economic, and then environmental pressures and physical activity. These are the big groupings that we wanna pay attention to. And in our next slide, we're gonna bring out just a few of those that we saw in that much larger, really complex you know, um, graph that we saw earlier. So let's look at those pit, um, potential contributors to obesity inside of the person, a few representative examples. Things that might increase one's intake are hyperreactivity to environmental food cues. Maybe you walk past a pizza place and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm, I really would like that pizza. Another person doesn't even notice the pizza place is there. Things like delayed satiety and disordered eating. Now, things that may decrease expenditure are things like the gut microbiota. What we do know is that the gut microbiota and in individuals that are lean versus those that have obesity differ drastically. Thermogenesis, how much someone's able to burn, I'd rest in with activity. A lot of that's genetically determined. And then of course, physical disabilities. If you have a disability, not able to burn as much as someone who is able-bodied. When we look at the things that might increase intake and decrease expenditure, we have to pay attention to genetic and epigenetic factors. These are very important. And it's important for us to recognize the heritability of obesity and recognize that weight is indeed more inheritable than height itself. Age-related changes are extremely important. And these are particularly important in women's lives because there are three key points in a woman's life where we see major weight shifts. Um, at the onset of menses, um, if the person decides to get pregnant, and at menopause. And then, of course, mood disturbances, things like depression and anxiety. There are contributors to obesity that are outside of an individual that we pay attention to. And you can see that this, there's a lot going on here. Things that may increase intake are environmental or chemical toxins, pervasive food advertising, or large portion sizes, for example. Things that may decrease expenditure are things like the built environment. How, what type of environment are you in that allows physical activity? Sedentary time and labor-saving devices like our lovely washing, washing machines and dryers and dishwashers, for example. Things that increase intake and decrease expenditure are things like stress. Stress leads to increase in inflammation, storage of adipose tissue, um, weight cycling. That means you start in this diet, you get off, you start again, you start, start a new diet, um, and that's problematic. And then maternal and paternal obesity, things that um, we want to pay attention to. Now, what I want to take you through are some of the key um, steps that we will utilize when we're looking at the guidelines from the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the Obesity Society. First, we'll start with the patient encounter. And in that patient encounter, we'll measure height, weight, and calculate BMI, thinking about um, what we talked about earlier with regards to BMI. We'll determine one's weight category because that weight category will have implications for our treatment modalities. We'll assess and treat cardiovascular disease risk factors and obesity-related conditions, and we will assess weight and lifestyle histories. You know, Fatima, before we do that, uh, let's ask our audience another question. Uh, so you could all vote uh, now. Here's the question. What minimum amount of weight loss can lead to therapeutic benefits in cardiovascular disease risk factors, such as diabetes, hypertension, or dyslipidemia? Is it 1%, 3%, 5%, 10%, or you're not sure? Fatima, let's see how they do. Excellent. All right, so I think we can see here that 56% of individuals said that about 3%, so two, and that is the correct answer, the minimum amount of weight loss that leads to benefits for cardiovascular disease. So you guys are doing really well. It means like I don't have to do much of my job, but let's continue with my work here. Now, when we're looking at weight loss in terms of diabetes prevention, hypertension, dyslipidemia, I do want to bring attention to this um, particular um, information that we have here on the diabetes care in 2015. What we can see is for diabetes prevention, as low as 3% weight loss can lead to significant shifts. You can see that ranges from three to 10%. With regards to remission of diabetes, of course, once we have the disease, remission of the disease greater than 15%, so a much larger percentage of weight loss needed. Um, hypertension, three to 15%. 
and dyslipidemia, three to greater than 15%. So it's important for us to assess and treat cardiovascular um, disease risk factors along with obesity related comorbidities. We'll start using our history and physical exam. So nothing really fancy, just doing a really thorough physical exam and getting great history from our patients. We wanna look at clinical and laboratory measurements. Things that are extremely important are things like the blood pressure, the fasting blood glucose, a fasting lipid panel that's based on expert opinion when these um, guidelines were developed and looking at waist circumference. Now in waist circumference, our typical target, particularly if we're looking at non-Hispanic white women would be less than 35 inches um, waist circumference um, for women and less than 40 inches. Um, this is measured at the widest portion at the umbilicus. With regards to intensive management of cardiovascular disease risk factors, these are just a few, a very, very small list of the several different diseases that are associated or caused by the disease of obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, prediabetes and diabetes, and then finally, obstructive sleep apnea. We do wanna assess weight and lifestyle histories. I talked about this when we were kind of looking at the different steps. So we wanna ask our patients about the history of weight gain and loss over time. That can give us a lot of information about this patient and their lifetime um, often of struggles with their weight. We wanna have details of previous weight loss attempts. We wanna capture dietary habits and physical activity. These are important. We talked about the heritability of obesity a bit earlier. So we wanna ask about the family history of obesity. And we wanna look at other medical conditions or medications as Dr. Kushner mentioned earlier that may affect weight. And then as we continue with our guidelines and following the guidelines, we wanna assess the need to lose weight. Um, we wanna advise to avoid weight gain and address other risk factors, but it's important for us to know how ready the patient is to make change. If the patient is not in the area of ready to make change, maybe their pre-contemplation, then maybe this conversation is something that we should have at a different time when they're ready to begin to address this. We want to identify barriers to excess. There, there are different reasons why patients may struggle, even with the guidance of persons like you see here on this panel that dedicate our lives to the treatment of patients with obesity. We want to determine weight loss and health goals and health strategies, intervention strategies that we might utilize. And we do want to think about comprehensive lifestyle therapies alone first or in conjunction with adjunctive therapies like pharmacotherapy or metabolic and bariatric surgery. Now, I will be remiss if I did a presentation and did not bring up this idea of weight stigma and how we as healthcare providers are often some of the worst perpetrators of weight stigma. And so I'm gonna talk about how we can impact our patients. So when a patient experiences weight stigma, that leads to stress. That stress in turn leads to changes in eating and physical activity behaviors where we see things like binge eating, um, increased caloric consumption, maladaptive weight control, a lower motivation for exercise, and with that, of course, less physical activity. But that stress actually leads to physiologic reactivity where we actually see increased levels of cortisol, CRP, hemoglobin A1C, and elevated blood pressure. So this stigma that they experience leads to that physiologic expression. What does that mean for them in terms of healthcare services? If we can go back um, to the previous slide, um, there's poor treatment adherence, less trust of health providers, avoidance of follow-up care, delay in preventive health screenings, and poor communication. All of those issues then lead to weight gain, which causes psychological health and distress. So we'll see things like depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, poor body image, substance abuse, and unfortunately, even suicidality. That then leads to physiologic health and distress, where we see poor glycemic control, less effective chronic disease self-management, more advanced and poorly controlled chronic disease, and finally, a lower health-related quality of life. So I want you to be mindful about how you yourself or your office setting may be contributing to stigma that can then affect the overall health of our patients. So when we look at how we engage in weight management counseling, I like to look at the six A's. And I think these six A's 
are really quite great in terms of thinking of us engaging. First, we wanna ask, we wanna ask for permission to begin to engage with patients about a discussion with their weight. We wanna use preferred terms. So you've noticed that during this presentation, we have used um, terms like with obesity, we don't call patients obese, that labeling is stigmatizing. We don't call them fat. We don't say morbid obesity. These, this language has been changed at the AMA level, even at 2017. We want to listen and avoid paternalism. That's important. And our personal biases that can contribute to worse outcomes with our patients. After asking, we want to then assess the patient. We want to look at the pre-encounter, um, look at weight-related um, issues that we've talked about. Determine what the patient's expectations are. And we want to make sure that our exam is centered on a patient that has obesity, exploring all of the things, looking for things like acanthosis, nigricans, which can be prominent in those that have obesity, um, hyperinsulinism, for example. Then we want to go to advising. We want to have a look at the positive aspects of providing care. Um, and we want to use the US um, PSTF guidelines. Notice we talked about BMI cutoff, and we want to pay attention to how this may differ by um, race and ethnicity. We want to look at the challenges of managing weight, recognizing this is a chronic disease that requires chronic therapy. Um, and we want to respect the patient if they're not interested. So if they're in that pre-contemplative state, we don't want to push them. We want to embrace this when they're ready to make a change with our interaction and help. Then we're going to agree. We're going to trust um, the model. Um, we're going to respond to patient cues. The patients are giving us the answers. So I always tell my patients they are the answer to the question. We want to consider issues like culture, religion. These are extremely important. Um, and we want to look at some SMART goals and think about treatment choices and efficacy. Then we'll go on to number five, which is to assist the patient. Um, look at options that are both written and electronically that we can give to our patients to help them. We want to leverage the entire team, um, the entire team in a multidisciplinary care of obese, um, obesity is extremely important. And so we want to pay attention to all the um, important players. And then finally, we want to arrange, arrange for follow-up visits, appropriate referrals, um, regional resources that the patients may need. We want to coordinate that care and be at the helm of that. Now, I wanted to make sure that you guys are aware, and this is something that you guys can get access to. This is a free resource that's developed by all of these wonderful groups that you see on the right side of your screen. Um, it's called the Weight Can't Wait Guide. Um, and it really helps you begin to have that initial conversations with patients. And so I think this is a wonderful, important tool and resource. So I would, I would take a look at this when you have a chance. It's a, available for download in the healthcare um, provider resources tab of this activity. Um, and then when we look at the treatment guidelines based upon the BMI criteria, it's important to recognize that we can lose, use lifestyle modifications, which include diet, exercise, and behavior changes across the entire BMI spectrum. I want you to see here on this slide that for Asian Americans, the cutoff is even lower. Um, you can see that the cutoff for really considering that is at the BMI of 23 and higher. So I want to pay, make sure that we are aware of that. With regards to pharmacotherapy, we typically begin to um, utilize pharmacotherapy um, in persons that have maximized lifestyle, um, have a BMI of 27 with an obesity-related disease, like hypertension, sleep apnea, for example. Um, and also for those persons that have a BMI of greater than or equal to 30, which means they have obesity um, without any um, obesity-associated disease. And if a medication is deemed effective, meaning they've lost about 5% of their total body weight loss at three months of use of the medication, we do recommend continuing the medication indefinitely. Yes, indefinitely. If we pull back the medications that are acting on obviously different portions of the brain to control weight, then we will see weight regain. Well, thanks, Fatima. That was a great uh, overview uh, of, of something that we do every day in our practice. Um, I'd encourage all of you to uh, read the guidelines uh, and go to the literature to supplement what Fatima went over with you. But that was really a really great, uh, great introduction or, or reminder of those of you, uh, for those of you already doing obesity care. Fatima, now that you have teased the section on treatment by addressing BMI cut points for initiating therapy, I want to turn to Ken Fujioka, who will address our third learning objective, 
which is assess efficacy and safety of available and emerging therapies for long-term treatment for obesity. Ken, go ahead, take it away. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Okay, we got a, a lot to cover, and uh, I hope you don't feel like you're back in med school pharmacology, but it is a little complex. Hang in there. I think you're going to get some really useful information because you're kind of looking at the future. Uh, I mean, I wish I was a young doc because these newer meds that are coming out for weight loss are, are really physiologic and are going to work much better than anything we've had before. So, you know, these are the order of drugs that have been improved recently. You got semaglutide, which is very recent, as you know, just literally a week ago or two weeks ago. You got setmelanotide, which is a whole nother, it's kind of part of that designer group of meds that you're going to be seeing. So, as you know, genetics and um, Fatima really explained well about how uh, the genetics can really play a big part of weight gain. And so, as Bob talked about, all these hormones are coming up telling you to stop eating GLP-1, PYY, amylin. But what if the receptor where they go to is broken so that they don't get the message? In other words, the food goes up. I mean, excuse me, the hormones go up to tell them they're full, but they don't stop eating because that receptor is genetically amino acid substitution. It kind of changes shape and doesn't work anymore. That's what this drug is for. So again, brand new group. And I'll show you how to use it because it's a little bit tricky because you need to find people with that genetic defect. You got Gelsis 100. Again, futuristic, brand new. And it's not really a pharmacologic agent. It's truly a device, but you're going to use it like any other drug. You're going to give it with lunch and dinner and it's going to expand and, and make them feel full. Kind of fascinating. But, but again, there's a line of drugs all coming, or excuse me, line of devices all coming along this line. Liraglutide, okay, this is the first of the, what I call the physiologic treatments, a GLP-1 hormone. When you eat a meal, your small intestines will taste the food and say, oh my God, there's some food, I better send up some GLP-1 to the brain and tell myself to stop eating and it's okay to lose weight. Yeah, this was the first of that group. And as you know, GLP-1s have been around forever for type two diabetes. Then we switch gears again, two very old drugs, naltrexone and bupropion. So not every drug works on everybody. Why? Because everybody has different reasons why they gain weight. But one of the more common, if you were to pool a hundred patients that came into your office struggling with weight and you asked them about cravings, do you crave a specific food? Cravings doesn't really have anything to do with hunger. It's a uh, uh, and again, as Dr. Stanford said, say you're stressed. And so when you're stressed, you got to have some chips or you got to have a, a chocolate bar or something like that. That's reward eating. And it's dopamine, norepinephrine kind of thing. And guess what? Bupropion works on dopamine, norepinephrine, so lowers that. But also it's an opiate driven behavior. So again, naltrexone. So this is a particularly good drug for cravings, but there are also some effects directly on the hypothalamus as well. Then you have, again, some older drugs, phentermine and topiramate. Now, quite honestly, nobody knows how topiramate works. I've never seen a good study to show it. We're guessing it's through the GABA system, which works, again, up in the hypothalamus to give a feeling of satiety, a very powerful one, actually. Um, and then phentermine, which is a stimulant. So stimulant is working along that norepinephrine dopamine avenue. Um, and then you got Orlistat, again, old medication over the counter now, just blocks the uptake of fat, or it's a lipase inhibitor. And then last off, phenamine by itself, which again has been around since the 50s, very old agent approved for short term use, you know, 12 weeks in a 12 month period. So you're saying, well, Ken, show me the money. How much weight loss am I going to get? So this graph really says it all. So you look at that blue bar with some aglutide and you're going, oh my gosh, 15% weight loss. And again, earlier, um, Dr. Stanford said, hey, look, all you got to do is get 5%. You're, you're improving all kinds of things. This is great. But now we're talking 15. This makes patients so happy because they don't want 5%. I mean, if they're 200 pounds, they don't want to see 10 pounds. With, they want 20, 30, 40 pounds. Guess what? Now these newer drugs are going to be doing that. It's not to say the other drugs don't work. They're good. And so you got phenamine to close to 10. You got uh, bupropion and naltrexone, on that green bar. It's about eight. And again, it'll work really well in some patients and maybe not so well in others, depending on the why they are gaining weight. And then you got uh, liraglutide, again, 
close to 8%. And then you got Orlistat, which is right around six. Next slide, thank you. And so I'm gonna spend more time on this newer class, just so you understand one, how we study these, which is just intense. You do multiple studies, but two, just so you can get a feel for, well, gee, my diabetic patient didn't lose as much weight or something like that. So you understand what's going on here. So step one is just a standard obesity trial, the standard run of the mill patient that comes in to see you and needs to lose weight. And they get some diet, some exercise, not intense, but you know, the standard, what we can do pretty easily as primary care docs. And you follow them for a year. Step two, now this is the tough group. Type two diabetics have a very tough time losing weight whether it's their genetics, their, their drugs are on, say sulfonylurea or insulin or whatever, they just don't lose as much. And so expect to see lower numbers. Then you step three is what I call the Wadden special. Tom Wadden has developed some of the best behavioral interventions for how to lose weight from just changing your behavior. So they did intensive behavior modification on this group plus a weight loss medication. So again, you'd expect to see some of the better weight loss in this group. And then the last group, which I'll spend the most time on, maintenance. This really just hammer homes the point that Dr. Kushner made in that biggest loser he talked about. Six years, they followed him. They were still, their body was still trying to regain the weight six years out. And in this study, that's really what they're doing. They're going to put the patients on both the, what, one group on, on the drug and another group on the drug for 20 weeks. So they're both getting it for 20 weeks, but after 20 weeks, then they split off. One gets a placebo, oh, I'd hate to be in that group. And then the other group gets the drug and stays on it out to a year. And so what happens is you're gonna see, hopefully, you know, one group do better than the other, or heck, maybe you just need it for 20 weeks. We'll find out. Next slide. Ken, before you go, let, I'm going to throw in another audience response You're question here. Roll, Bob. Okay. Yeah, I know. I'm going to have you hold, hold it there. Uh, and then <laughs> I'm going to have you respond to it. So here's our last question. You can vote now. In the step three trials, what proportion of participants attended, excuse me, attained at least a 5% weight loss in the semaglutide 2.4 milligram arm versus placebo? Was it more than 50%, more than 65%? nearly 70%, more than 80%, or you're not sure? What do you guys think? Go ahead and vote. I'm not sure. I think there's two answers there, but it's a tough one. Okay, not too bad. I'll tell you, the answer is all over the place. Don't worry if you didn't get this one right. And I'll show you in the next slide why that is. So if you look at this, if you look, particularly if you look at the diabetics, which is, again, this is really good for diabetics, but, you know, losing at 5%, that third uh, row down, 68.8% lost at least 5%. So again, and, and again, as Dr. Stanford said, you lose 5%, you're moving in the right direction in a really nice way. You're getting cardiovascular benefits, you're improving all kinds of really nice things. But all the other groups, they're like over 85%. We've not seen this before. In the past, we were happy just to get half the patients to lose at least 5%. So again, this is a whole other ballpark. Let's move. Uh, so step one, on average, it lost about 15% or 14.9. Again, and, then, and you saw in the other studies, this is a, another ball game. The diabetics just under 10%, 9.6, which again, most of the time in these studies, they lose less than five. Now with more intensive behavior modification, now you're getting over 15%. 16%. And actually in that study, well over a third of the patients were losing over 20%. That's what you lose with bariatric surgery. So again, whole nother ball game. Now, step four was the one that really just blew my mind. And, and again, it's hard to look at these numbers. Remembering both groups, the placebo group and the semaglutide group were on drug for 20 weeks. After 20 weeks, you can see the semaglutide group who had already lost um, close to 10% of their weight lose another 8%. So they're losing, you know, 17.4% at the end of that trial, really good. But the placebo group, you can see after they stop the drug, they're, they're, they're injecting every day, they're still doing diet, they're still doing exercise, they gain 7%. Oh, bummers. But it tells you, again, what Bob was teaching, this metabolic adaptation thing is very real and hangs in there for a very long time. This is just the 
kind of give you an idea of this of the weight loss. And again, I'm dating myself, but back when I was studying these things in the early 90s, you know, we would see most of the weight loss in the first two months, three months. Not so anymore. And again, you're not really giving a drug, you're giving a hormone. You see the slow, steady weight loss out to 63 weeks. I mean, that's impressive. And so the top group is, you know, all comers and what we call intention to treat. Uh, in other words, if they came in once, you just carry their weight out to the end, or if they came in through the whole time, you use their weight. But the bottom group, this is a group hopefully that we see, the group that comes in, they follow up, they take their meds. Well, I guess not all patients do that, but we like them to. But notice that weight loss is actually still going down at 63 weeks. It's just real steady. And again, they're getting weight loss well, you know, well above 15%. Yeah, you're getting, and, and this, you know, any new future weight loss med is going to have to be in this this realm. And, and again, they are, which is really cool. Next slide. So how about the problems? You know, not every drug's perfect. And, and I'm going to try and do some teaching on just GLP ones in general. So how do they work? We talked about it. You know, you're, you eat a meal, you send a GLP one up to the brain to tell you, stop eating, tell the brain, yeah, it's okay to lose weight. But it also, there are GLP receptors in the GI tract and it slows down gastric emptying. And when you slow down gastric emptying, it doesn't feel really good. And it can feel like nausea to a lot of your patients. So you can see in the very top one, 44% of the patients had nausea. And this all happens in the beginning when you first start it, when you first start ramping up the dose, which takes months. So hang in there. And this is where you as the prescriber got to do your job and just slow down the titration. Just don't go up real fast. If they have nausea, don't keep driving up the dose because they're, they're going to get more nauseated. They're going to get diarrhea. They're going to get vomiting. So again, just don't go faster. But the top three, diarrhea, vomiting, a little bit of constipation. Constipation is tough because we see that in general with just weight loss. And you're going, wow, the top four, you have both diarrhea and constipation. And again, everybody's different. Next slide. So these are... This is just a teaching slide, just so you know, well, then how do you tell if your drug's working and should you even continue to use it? Is there something I can, you know, something I can look for? Is there something that tells me this drug is better for that patient? So, so far, we really struggle with finding the right drug for the right patient. So one of the best ways is just give the drug and see what happens. So with Gelesis, you can see that at eight weeks, if they had at least 3% weight loss, they went on to lose at least 5%. As a matter of fact, they lost almost 10%. If you look at phenamine topiramate, same thing. Within 12 weeks, if they lose 3% or more, they go on to lose more than 5%. And again, they lose over 10% if they're in that group. Bupropion naltrexone, it's a little bit longer. So you got to go out four months or 16 weeks, and they have to lose at least 5% or more. And that group will go on and lose more or over 5%. And again, about 10%. And then last time, loraglutide, again, very close. Um, 4% or more weight loss to 16 weeks, they're going to go on to lose more than 5% or 5% or more or around 10%. Next slide. So, and you know, the person doing the slides probably saying, Ken, quit saying next slide. I know what I'm doing. So I'm sorry. It's just, it's in me. All right. So when you're looking at the weight loss, and I'm just trying to point this point out, if let's say they don't lose 4% at 16 weeks, then you see those top two lines, 3% or 3.1, that's how much weight they lose. They don't lose much weight. But again, if they lose 4% or more of their weight at 16 weeks, look at that weight loss. It goes all the way out. They're losing 8.5. That's your diabetics. Or again, in your uh, non-diabetics, it's over 10% weight loss. So again, that first three to four months are really crucial and will really teach you a lot about you know, whether they respond to that med. If they don't, you may have to use a different one. Another, another teaching slide. If you do use uh, phenamine topiramate, which um, it's a tricky drug to use, and I'll go over some of the, the pearls on how do you use it because there are some uh, things you need to be careful of. But what I'm trying to teach here is when you look at 108 weeks, so in other words, at the end of the study, two years plus, that the, the mid dose, the 7.5 of phenamine with 46 topiramate you get 9.3% weight loss. But if you look at the one below that, the bigger dose, 15 of phenamine with 92 of topiramate, you get 10.5. So in other words, you get about 1% more of weight loss. 
But what this slide doesn't tell you is when you go up in dose, you get more side effects. And again, this medication tends to be a little tricky to use because when you have two drugs, you get twice as many side effects. So you have a stimulant on one side, you got topiramate, which has its own set of side effects. So again, personally, I like to use that mid dose and stick with that. In the long run, I'm knowing I'm getting pretty good weight loss. Uh, oh, so this is, again, you guys are just stepping into these new, neat, new just devices now. So what are non-systemic super absorbent hydrogels? So these are little particles. They basically take cellulose. I mean, we're, we're talking, it, it, it's called by the FDA grass. No, 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 not marijuana. Generally regarded as safe. And um, so it's, it's in that category. And also it's not absorbed. And you cross-link it with citric acid, vitamin C. And when you do that, when you add water to it, you can get it to expand. So it's basically like all of a sudden making a filler really quick. The trick is the patient has to drink 16 ounces of water with it. So they do this with lunch and with dinner. And then this thing expands, 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 that's a new word, expands, and then goes through the small intestines and giving a feeling of fullness. So again, and, and you're going to see more of these coming out. They're, they're very, the, 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 what I call the food technology is ramping up again at this incredible rate. Next slide. So the weight loss is pedestrian, but you can really improve it. But again, by using the responders. So if you, if you got your responders, they lose, you know, 3% or more with just within two months, you know, they're going to go on to lose 10%. But the placebo group, as you can see there, lost about 4.39%. They actually lost kind of a lot. And whenever you drink water before a meal, if you can drink 16 ounces of water, yeah, you lose a little bit of weight. Um, so the drug group, or excuse me, the device group loses 6.41%. So, okay, good. They lose more statistically significant. And again, if you follow the responder analysis rules, they'll get much better weight loss. All right the designer drug. So we're going to be talking about setmelanotide, which is, so believe it or not, if you were to check the genetics of all your patients that came in with morbid obesity, about one in 20. So you might see one of these patients once a week. If you, they'll have what's called a single gene mutation. So in other words, one of the genes that controls food intake is broken. And in this particular site, when we look at what we're looking for is an MC4 receptor defect. And so these folks, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, when you eat a meal, you send up hormones to the brain to tell you to stop eating. But these poor folks have a broken receptor. So they just don't get it. it it's really interesting to watch them eat because they're sitting there eating and they're actually looking around the room. Oh, he stopped. Oh, she stopped. Maybe I should stop eating now because they're, again, they don't get the signal. The only time they know to stop eating is when it actually gets uncomfortable. And then they've eaten too many calories at that point. So they never get satiated, which, which is really tough. And I'm always impressed with these patients who keep their weight down because they really work at it. The way you confirm that they have this, one of these genetic defects, and there's several of them, they just do a simple oral swab test, just, you know, put in a swab, send it off and they can find it out. And again, they're running these things for free because they're, everyone's trying to find these patients right now. So the reason why we didn't include their weight loss with the other graph that we showed earlier is just because they did a very unusual study and they combined all the different studies in one, because again, this is a very rare genetic disease, but again, it's probably more common than we think. We just don't look for it. So that I, I think it's orange or red uh, dot is the mean, but they show actually all the patients in study, which isn't a huge number of patients. They did do other trials though. So they had enough patients to get it approved. But you can see that in that first 12 weeks, everybody, you know, gets the med, uh, except for the placebo group, which is up there a little bit. No, excuse me. Everybody gets the drug because again, it's an, this is an ultra orphan drug. So you don't have to have a placebo arm necessarily. So you see the weight loss go down for 12 weeks, then they stop it. And that kind of gives you what happens in placebo. They're still taking a drug or they think they are they're taking placebo, but you can see the weight start going back up. They restarted at week 20. Guess what? The weight starts going back down. So they're, they're getting the weight loss. It works. And again, look at that weight loss. I mean, it, on the left side, you know, 10, 20% weight loss. 
This is a group that's notoriously difficult to get weight loss in because again, they have a broken receptor. Even with bariatric surgery, they do far worse than the other bariatric surgical patients. So now to have a targeted therapy is just, to me, just neat and huge. And again, very satisfying uh, for both you and the patient. Next slide. All right, this is the future, guys. This is not approved combination. Don't do this at home. But this is when you combine two of the satiety hormones together. And again, 20% is the weight loss you see, 20, 25% is the weight loss you see with bariatric surgery, which is very appealing to everybody, to the patients, to you, everybody's happy. But look at this weight loss. When you get into those upper doses of combining um, amylin, in this place, it's uh, cargrinotide with semaglutide. And you get this just weight loss going rapidly down well out to 20 weeks. They stop it at about 19 weeks and you can see the weight loss slowly going back up. But remember this drug stays in your body for a week, both of them do. And it's just a once a week injection, phenomenal. And then obviously starts going back. So, you know, my guess is, is that this weight loss is gonna be now in that 20 to 25% range. Because again, again as, as Dr. Kushner said, there's all these different hormones in that really kind of cool looking video you saw, all trying to go up to the brain and tell you to stop eating. Because again, we died of starvation, you know, 10,000 years ago. And that's how our genetics are set back then. So you're sending up four, five, six, seven hormones to tell you to stop eating. Well, if you're replacing one, okay, you get good weight loss. You replace two, now you're gonna get a lot better weight loss. Who knows, you might even replace three. So again, this is a future and it looks really bright. All right, so let's go over the pearls, the, the tough part. You know, how do you, where do you put them? Where do you set them in? So semaglutide and liraglutide, again, are both in the same category because they're both GLP-1s. And just so you know, all the weight loss drugs, everything from phenamine and semaglutide, they're all category X. Why? Because you don't want your patient losing weight when they're pregnant. It's not a good thing, not good for the fetus. And even if you have a patient who's severely overweight, you want to maybe keep her weight stable, but you don't want her losing weight because, again, that's tough on the fetus. And I'll jump down to phenamine and topiramate. Now, there is a special um, note here. Topiramate is associated with cleft lip and cleft palate. So you really don't want to give this one to a woman who might get pregnant. So you, we just personally, I don't use it at all. If you do, then they actually recommend you get monthly pregnancy tests. Um, but back up to the top two, GLP-1. So it's, it's all the typical stuff with GLP-1s, um, medullary thyroid carcinoma, MEN2, kind of uh, unusual diseases that can affect the thyroid. And again, there are some GLP-1 receptors on the thyroid. So that's why they have that. Um, side effects, again, GI, 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 or nausea, nausea, diarrhea, diarrhea, vomiting. And again, you're slowing down the gastric emptying and you have the potential to get these other problems. Um, Again, it's all during the dosing, just slow it down. These are more what I call tolerability issues, not safety issues. Now, Trexone bupropion, now, um, thank you. Uh, now, Trexone and bupropion, they can raise blood pressure. And it's mainly the, believe it or not, the bupropion, not the naltrexone that's doing that. And it's funny, they don't have this warning when you use it for cigarette cessation, which I find interesting. Um, but anyway, um, if somebody has a seizure disorder, you don't want to use it because bupropion, because it, it's an uptake inhibitor of norepinephrine and dopamine can make someone at risk for seizure disorder. But again, when you look at the side effects, it's all GI. It's funny, but, and that's probably the naltrexone. When we were studying this really early on, we saw with the immediate release naltrexone, unacceptable nausea and vomiting. But again, nausea, constipation, headaches, they kind of happen there. Uh, phenamine topiramate, Phenamine is a stimulant. So you get all the things that come with stimulants. Topiramate is an unusual drug that gives you, it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So you can get paresthesias of the hands. Some patients just feel off on topiramate. They don't quote think as well. So again, look for all that stuff. Use the lowest dose you can. Orlistat, old drug, been around for a long time, just blocks the absorption of fat. So expect some of that, those types of side effects, oil leakage, oily spotting, uh, when they pass gas, things like that. Set melanotide, you know, surprisingly no contraindications, but brand new drug. And it's, you're saying skin hyperpigmentation. You got to remember that when you're firing the system of the brain 
that works on the MC4 receptor, it works through the uh, MSH or melanotite stimulating hormone. So you see skin hyperpigmentation. Um, whether this is normal, I don't think so, but it's not abnormal. And again, I don't know how to tell you this because again, uh, these patients will be fairly uh, light skinned when they start and then their skin will darken up. Uh, headaches, diarrhea, kind of the usual stuff, a potential, again, when you deal in the brain that deals with fullness and food, for some reason, you can get spontaneous uh, erection. So again, that's a potential, uh, again, very, very rare. And then Gelsis uh, 100, which is again, the super absorbent hydrogel. When you eat these three capsules, you drink a bunch of water and they swell, you can get kind of this oh, I don't know, full feeling really quick. And patients interpret that differently. Usually I hear bloating is what I hear from patients. And it may give you a little more gas or constipation or diarrhea. So again, everybody's different. Well, thanks, Ken, for a, a great review of uh, pharmacotherapy as well as devices. Uh, again, I would encourage all of you to do more reading, uh, increase your competence and familiarity with these drugs. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more during the Q&A, but they're, they're underutilized in patients who would potentially benefit from more aggressive treatment and lifestyle. So Ken, thanks so much for giving an overview. Now, before we get into our Q&A session, here are our SMART goal takeaway points. Now, SMART goals are usually used for, patient, uh, for patients when we talk about behavior change, but I'm going to apply them to you, our audience, regarding takeaways. And here they are. Encourage you to encourage patients with obesity to get fully vaccinated for COVID-19. That's ongoing and, and we still need to do more vaccination, not only in this country, but globally. Ensure equitable clinical interactions with all patients and avoid stigmatizing language. Apply the six A's model for weight management counseling that Fatima went over. Partner with patients and employ shared decision-making to improve adherence to therapies and improve outcomes. And lastly, what Ken went over, prescribe therapies for weight loss when indicated that can center energy balance dysregulation and the underlying biologic metabolic adaptations to weight loss. So let's now get started with our Q&A. Uh, to ask a question, please click on the Ask Question tab and type your question. Please include the faculty's name if you want to, or we'll just go ahead and take it ourselves. So I'm gonna ask Fatima and Ken to join me here. We have a whole series of questions uh, that I'm going to ask, and I'll feed you guys, and I'll jump in myself uh, as well. You know, Fatima, I'm going to I'm going to address this one to you first, uh, and that is uh, how, how how does a primary care clinician do a a competent uh, and adequate job in obesity care in a crowded office visit, which is often 15 minutes? What what do you tell the primary care provider? Absolutely. I think that's an excellent question, Bob. And I think the key thing is that we know that your time is limited. And so you may need frequent visits, which is exactly what we want when we're working with patients with obesity anyway. So maybe you do a portion of all of those things that I said at one visit, maybe you do another portion, another visit and another portion and another visit. So three full visits, um, but that allows you to engage with the patient. And I think that you start to build up trust. Um, a lot of times there's a lot of distrust um, for patients with obesity, with, with their physicians and, and showing that you really care and want to do a thorough job, I think is, um, is what you will find if you get a chance to do that in kind of small bite-sized pieces um, for a lack of better way of saying it. So that would be my strategy if I were primary care um, doing this, a very busy primary care, you know, doing bits and pieces and then building upon each other, developing that comprehensive strategy for the patient. Yeah, it, it, it is challenging. Um, I often talk about setting up a separate visit, you know, and prior to coming in, have them track their diet, uh, have them prepared for the, you know, chronic care model be prepared at both patient and physician to do that adequate job. So it's very, very challenging. Thanks. <clears throat> Ken, there's a, there's a question I want to, I want to toss to you. Um, and you went over very nicely, uh, you know, the different medications are available, including a device, the, the, uh, the gelosis device, uh, which is a capsule. How, how are clinicians supposed to decide which, which one of these to choose if they want to become more aggressive with their patient? Wow. That's a tough one. So, uh, 
And what I'm about to say probably would be considered off label. But if you want to be aggressive, you know, just use your standard skills. In other words, if they have cravings, okay, maybe I might use something that addresses cravings. Several of there are several studies on some of these that actually show they work very well in cravings. The other one, and again, this is part of the future, you probably you may have to use one or two or three medications to help lose weight, just like type two diabetes. Now that's being the most aggressive and you really wanna be well-versed in these medications, especially their side effects and interactions with other drugs. But you know, picking the right one is always the hardest. And I, I wish, and Bob's worked on a ton of these guidelines and we just, we don't have enough data to tell us which one to use. It's just been a real hit and miss thing. I have one thing to say also to what um, Dr. Stanford, Dr. Trishan were saying about how in a busy practice, how do you do it? And I'm, I'm maybe not as busy because I'm near the end of my career, but I'm really lazy. So what I do is I, I farm a lot of my things out. So one is I use dietitians a lot. Dietitians are great. They, they believe me, they, they can really answer a lot of nutritional questions, which can take up a ton of time. The other one is I will use commercial programs as well. I'm, uh, and I don't, get any stock or own anything in Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers, but those are two fairly good systems that most patients have access to do. And if say you're adding in a medication to that, you get outstanding weight loss. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point, Ken. I'm so glad you brought it up. I use the term team sport. You know, BC is a team <laughs> sport. You know, you don't have to be, you could be quarterback if you want, but it's still a team. And we're not dietitians. We're not health psychologists. You're not, we're not intensive behavioral therapists. At least we don't have the time, even if we often want to. So you make such a great point of bringing in the team, assessing a patient like Fatima talked about, and assessing for additional needs and resources. That's so darn important. Fatima, do you want to weigh in on that as well? It's such a good point. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm obviously, you know, in obesity medicine in a comprehensive center. Thankfully, I have a lot of those people in place. And so I wanted to address it from the vantage point of not having four full-time psychologists and several, you know, four full-time dietitians and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I do want to be mindful of the fact that I recognize that resources can be limited in some settings. And you may find that those things can't be done in the context of just what's happening in your office. But I think that um, Ken brings up a, a important point. Now, when I talk about this team sport, I always tell my patient, they're the star player and I'm the coach, right? I can't do anything without them showing up and doing their best job, you know? Um, and so that really gets them to think about it um, in a way of like, oh, wait a minute, I'm the star player. I need to show up and I'm, I'm really the supporting cast. But I said, I can coach, but if the player or the team doesn't show up, then I can, you know, the, the game doesn't get played. And I really think of, you know, using, you know, these analogies to help you with your interaction with patients really goes a long way in setting up great rapport. Yeah, the, the medical medical terms would be patient centered care and shared decision making. You you I think you elaborate on it so much better that people would understand taking those medical terms and actually applying it. The team, let me come back to you with this question, and Ken may uh, uh, Ken may want to weigh in as well. There's a question about a patient comes in wants to address his or her obesity, their weight. They've been around the block a few times. This isn't their first rodeo, right? They've okay. tried medic. They've tried a diet. They may even seen a registered dietitian. Uh, can we talk about using medication on that first visit, or do we say, you know what? Let let's like reinforce what you've already done. Like show me that you can do it, and you and you know what you're doing. Then we'll talk about medication. Or can you jump in medication right away? How do you how do you sequence that? Yeah, I think it, you know, depends on, on what you, what you feel comfortable with, but I think that we do a disservice to patients with obesity when we don't begin to consider medications, you know, sooner. Um, we don't have a patient come in with diabetes and say, you know what, you know, I know I see that hemoglobin A1C is nine, but you know what, go and eat less exercise more and come back, right? That, that would be inappropriate. We would lose our license. Um, we don't do that with hypertension. We don't do it with anything else. And so I really think that we need to be mindful. Um, when Dr. Fujioka presented those results and looking at the medications and looking at the response that we can get, the range of response, um, you can say, I can tell you that that can be extremely encouraging for patients. And for those patients that have been around the block, Many of them have some of those building blocks with regards to diet quality, right? Physical activity, they have those in part and they find that, look, their body is just resisting movement um, down. And so those medications are working on those different pathways of the brain that we talked about, 
to change how their brain sees weight. And so I can tell you today, I saw patients right up into the moment I came on camera and I had patients that were responding to medications, half of the combinations that Dr. Fujioka um, pointed out and just to see the smiles on their face and to see how encouraged they felt after 55 years of never being able to have any measurable change it really, I mean, it brightens my day, I think sometimes more than it brightens their day. So I really want us to be thoughtful and mindful about how we have that stigma against avoiding therapy and making the patient work for it um, when we don't do that with anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there was a, a, a bunch of questions on this metabolic adaptation, the first part of the talk that I gave about how long does it last and, and so on. And I just wanna highlight just a few things. To me, it really speaks to the biology of, of obesity uh, and what is going on there. And there's clearly a role for foundational lifestyle changes, diet, physical activity, uh, don't smoke, don't use alcohol excessively, uh, sleep, stress, and so on. Um, but those metabolic changes, as far as we know, are long lasting. Six years in the, in, in the, um, in the uh, Biggest Loser contest uh, and other studies uh, in, in the clinic and as well as in research centers have shown that they last uh, long as well. We have two biological inter interventions that seem to have an impact on that metabolic adaptation. One is pharmacotherapy that Ken went over and the other is bariatric surgery, which we didn't get a chance to talk about today. So, but it speaks to the biology of this chronic relapsing disease and what we could actually uh, do about it in addition to lifestyle, of course, which is foundational. Uh, Ken, I want to turn to you. There's there's a lot of questions on, on semaglutide. I think it's because it's the, the latest kid on the block and you went over the four-step trials and so forth. But the kinds of questions we're getting is, can a, can, a, can a PCP prescribe semaglutide or should it go to a specialist? How long can we keep someone on semaglutide? What's the longest day do we have on semaglutide? So uh, as well as cost and coverage. Can you answer some of those questions for the audience? Sure. At my age, though, that many questions, I'll forget a half of them by the time I get even through the first one. But, you know, uh, first off, if you're primary care, please feel free to use it. It is. I like it because it's it's a drug. It, it's an injectable. And I know some primary care docs don't feel comfortable, but most are quickly becoming very adaptable. It's sub Q. It's easy to do. And they'll just send you the boxes and you do it. And the, the only part part you need to do as the primary care doc is just make sure you titrate it slowly so they're not getting too much nausea because it's, it's going to work. And, and again, at least a third, 40% are going to have nausea and you just need to slow it down and they're going to do great. And you will just slowly creep up over months. I mean, it may take you six months, eight months to get to where you need to be. How long do you give this? And again, Bob just brought this up. You're fighting biology. So you really think of this as a forever long-term drug. Now, whether they'll be on this one forever, no. I, there's just too many good things coming out. And there'll probably be some kind of injection in five to 10 years. They'll just do once a month. And it'll kind of help out these hormones to, I, I hate to use the term reset, because we, as far as we know, the hypothalamus never resets. Once you, whatever the highest weight it thinks you're at, it stays at that forever, but at least tell the brain it's okay to stay at this lower weight. Um, Bob, you had like a couple of other questions. Well, you maybe want to just touch briefly upon this whole idea of reimbursement and cost because, you know, the most, the most vulnerable population, unfortunately, often doesn't have insurance coverage for many of these medications. I wonder if you had some comments just about the coverage that we're seeing and, and where that direction is going. Okay. So I'll start with the last part. The direction is going, we're going to see more and more coverage. And that's been shown over the last about four years now, which is just huge. And um, who's covered? This is a really odd question because it really comes down to whoever their employer is. If their employer opts in on their insurance to cover uh, weight loss medications, they're home free. And that's about, if you just went across the U.S., about a third of your patients. Now, in some places, say Texas, say the Carolinas, it's like 80, 90%. So again, it's very different from state to state. And I don't know why that is. In California here, we're roughly right around 30%. So again, it depends. What's really odd to me, so I've never seen Medicare cover it, but Medi-Cal uh, or uh, Medicaid, as it's called in some states, actually covers it in California. So again, I never can figure out who it's covered for. And 
quite honestly, I'm pretty lazy. I just write it and send it in. And, and again, on the cost issue, yeah, if they've got to pay for it. They're looking at about $1,000 a month. That's out of the pocket of 99% of my patients. So again, they're really looking for coverage. And the only way I know to find out is just send it in on my EMR and see what goes on. And if it's covered, if I do a prior auth, okay, I write out the prior auth and send it back. Um, and again, it, it, it can be tough for some patients because they will be good candidates, but it won't get covered. Yeah, I have thanks, some Ken. thoughts on that, um, Bob, please, if you don't please. mind. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, as someone that really spends a lot of time in Capitol Hill, I'll be speaking with Pelosi's team next week. Um, a lot of the coverage issues come down to what does Medicare cover? Because the private insurers, the employer-sponsored insurers follow Medicare. So we've been trying to get through, and the, the three of us, along with others, have been trying to get through Congress, both the House and the Senate, um, TROA, which is the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, which would cover both behavioral therapy, so work with dietitians, for example, for obesity, but also pharmacotherapy for um, patients with obesity in the Medicare population. Um, what I can tell you when we're looking at Medicare um, is that Medicare does not cover um, a lot of these agents. Many of these, um, as you could tell, the drugs that Dr. Fujioka presented, um, many of them are combinations of things, and we may use the generics um, for patients to make sure that we're using them. Obviously, the GLP ones at this time, um, particularly the ones that are approved for the treatment of obesity, are not yet um, at a generic level, um, meaning you know there's still several years left. For example, for liraglutide to come off label. Um, for for me, I work with a lot of patients that are under Mass Health. Mass Health is what became the Affordable Care Act. Um, those medications are not covered for also under that domain. So you have to be creative in using some of the agents that you can see combinations of meds that you're familiar with your use um, in the primary care setting. Um, that is what I've done to ensure that my patients do get access to pharmacotherapy. Um, but I would say for each of you that are listening um, to really advocate for troll, we've tried for eight years to get this through Congress um, and have strong bipartisan support since obesity is not um, preferentially um, target one um, party, political party, but um, we have not yet got it across the finish line. So we need more voices out there. Right. Fatima, thanks so much for jumping in here. That's just great information to get across. Um, I want to go back to one of the questions about, do you have to be a specialist to prescribe these anti-obesity medications? And, and the answer is no, of course you don't. Uh, currently, only about 3% of individuals who are candidates for medication receive a medication that needs to change. I always say clinicians need to be part of the solution, not continue part of the problem. So we need to increase competence and familiarity. However, if you do see a patient with a complicated case of obesity or you don't feel you're able to uh, handle that patient, I do want you to know that there is the American Board of Obesity Medicine, the ABOM. And if you're interested in becoming identified uh, as an obesity specialist or wanting more information uh, regarding it and take a certification exam for that, you can go to abom.org. And that's just very helpful for you to be aware of. Um, Fatima, I want to I want to come back to you. There's a question here, which is a very practical question, and, and we need to answer it. The question is, what lifestyle changes do you use with patients? So let's go back to that, you know, five, 10 minute drill with a patient, right? 15 minute thing, and you set some time aside. How how do you prioritize and you could use the six A's, which is a great framework that you went over. Yeah. But what what should we really be prioritizing in our limited time with patients about lifestyle change? Absolutely. And that's a great question. And I, I think you have to listen to what the patient struggles with, but the, the key big areas are looking at diet quality. You know, I think that, you know, um, severe caloric restriction and having to do, a, you know, elimination diet, these things, these aren't sustainable over the life course. So we want things that work within their life course that they can sustain indefinitely. We want to prioritize lean protein, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables as our predominant source of intake. And fit that with the patient in their cultural setting, however that needs to work. That's what I want to think about. Activity, which is my favorite thing to talk about. Actually, I would be working out now if I was not doing this, um, is you want to talk about at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. But with patients with obesity, the target is actually somewhere around 300 minutes of moderate intensity. And that's mostly for weight maintenance. So we know physical activity doesn't typically drive a significant amount of weight loss. Um, I want to prioritize looking at quality and duration of sleep. I think that's important. You want to evaluate the patients. Um, this is something you brought up, Bob, earlier, medications that may be weight promoting, leading to weight gain, seeing if they're needed. If not, you know, withdrawing those. 
Um, I think that these are really some of the key elements that I bring up with like every single patient, but I'm listening to the story they're giving to decide which one I need to emphasize first, because addressing all of that once will lead to disaster, right? You're going to start in a graduated fashion. And I think starting with diet quality, which is where I started in this, in this answer is where I typically will set my sights as the first area of interest. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. I, I agree really completely. It's, it's challenging. And I always tell uh, my medical students, residents and, and physicians ha- have the script in your head. You know, if you're, if you're jumping into a patient care visit and you haven't really have your script in your mind of what you're going to go over, like everything you just said, Fatima, you're going to be struggling. So be prepared to talk to the patient and have that script or narrative that you're actually uh, going, uh, going on. So uh, I'm, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, flip to the end here. Um, and I want to thank you all for your time today uh, and the esteemed colleagues, Fatima uh, Cody, as well as Ken Fujioka. Thank you so much. Fatima Stanford Cody, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, helping out today and for our audience. Uh, to receive CME CE credit, Click on the Request Credit tab to complete the post-test and evaluation online. Be sure to fill out your ABIM ABIM ID number and date of birth, month and date only, on the evaluation so we can submit credit to the ABIM. You can print your certificate or statement of credit immediately. To claim CME credit as a MIPS improvement activity, Complete the activity post-test and evaluation at the link provided. Over the next 90 days, actively work to incorporate improvement in your clinical practice from this presentation. Complete the follow-up survey from CME Outfitters in approximately three months. CME Outfitters, Outfitters will send you confirmation of your participation to submit to CMS attesting your completion of a CME for MIPS improvement activity. And don't forget to visit the virtual education hub for free resources, including the animated features you saw today. Once again, thank you uh, for attending today and thank you for uh, the staff for helping out.